These crystal clear waters are part of a delicate and threatened environment. I love snorkeling on reefs like this, but the real reason for coming 8,000 miles from home is to look at a subject that I just couldn't ignore in a series about survival. In this program, I've come to the tropics, to where the South China Sea meets the Pacific Ocean, to look at the classic survival scenario of staying alive on a desert island. These are just some of the 7,000 islands that make up the Philippines, and they make this corner of the world the perfect place for a would-be castaway. The island I'm heading for is the most remote and inaccessible location in this series. I've flown south from Manila for two hours to the island of Palawan, traveled seven hours by road, and I'm going to be on this boat for three hours, which means I'm going to arrive well after dark. The boat I'm travelling on is a traditional wooden banker. They've been used here for centuries, and the crew use centuries-old skills to navigate. They have to find their way through a maze of reefs and atolls with no charts or radar. But they know these waters like the back of their hand, and they can even find their way in the dark. I love arriving in wild places at night. You simply can't beat it because you've got no idea at all what's here. All you've got to go on are the smells and the sounds. At times like this, your imagination simply runs riot. But that can work both ways. You could imagine that this would be a pretty threatening place if you were cast away here for real. Psychologically, it's vital to feel comfortable with your surroundings. So when the sun comes up, I'll start to explore every corner of the island. But for now, I'm going to concentrate on a few simple comforts. A hammock is my favorite way to sleep in the tropics. But there's one really important tip when you're on an island, and that is don't tie it up to a coconut tree, because the last thing you want in the night is to be brained by one falling on your head. It's been three years since I was last on an island like this, and I can't wait to use some of the skills I learned then. At times like this, I always feel a huge sense of anticipation. But the first rule of survival is not to rush into anything. Quiet reflection, taking stock of your situation, should always be the first priority. And sitting by a simple fire is amazingly comforting if you've just arrived in a strange place. Well, this is what I couldn't see when I got here last night. Paradise, everything you'd expect a desert island to be. A blue sea, pristine beach, with coconut palms behind. The classic tale of desert island survival has to be Robinson Crusoe, a story that's now over 300 years old, but as popular today as it ever was. There are even Caribbean islanders who claim to be descended from him, despite the fact that he's a totally fictional character. Crusoe's tale was inspired by a Scottish sailor called Alexander Selkirk. In 1704, he marooned himself on a Pacific island after falling out with his captain. He was terrified at first, but he overcame his fear and loneliness to stay alive until he was rescued after four years. It's incredible to think that the basic skills he used 300 years ago still have any relevance in the modern world, but they do. 1945 and the battle for the Pacific raged on the sea and in the sky. Until the Second World War, no one had given any thought to military survival training. Now though, a pilot could get shot down hundreds of miles inside enemy territory. If he survived that, he'd have to know how to live off his wits until he was rescued. John Craighead and his brother Frank were pioneers of military survival training. 
They taught airmen how to live off the land while avoiding capture. We taught them how to travel in various types of terrain, how to build shelters. Uh, we taught them plant foods that they could find and use and, and how to make fish hooks and whatnot so they could catch fish. And uh, then we taught them how to build a fire and how to climb coconut trees. <laughs> you have to be in pretty good shape to do that. But the training was carried out in the United States, so downed airmen would have no experience in tropical survival before they needed it for real. So survival was a pretty hit and miss affair, basically coming down to how well an individual serviceman could adapt the training he'd received in the United States to this particular environment. As I'll show you, there are specific skills you need to know, otherwise your chances are slim. So after the war, the American military decided to improve the odds. They sent the Craigheads to the Pacific to gather as much information as they could from local people. We uh, made trips into the jungle and uh, kept uh, notes of the kind of plants we found and what we lived on and uh, got a, a feel for how difficult it, it would be. They compiled their findings into a survival guide, which has been used by the US military ever since. They found that preparation was the key to survival. The tools they had with them were almost as important as the resources they found. Even now, people often wonder, what luxury would they take with them to a desert island? For me, the answer is solidly practical. My personal luxury is gonna be this, a parang or machete, because a tool like this simply makes life possible here. Many of the US airmen who found themselves on islands like this didn't even have a knife with them. And in some cases, they died because they couldn't open a coconut to get at the food and liquid to be found inside it. Here, local people call the coconut the tree of life. It provides them with materials for building and clothes, with wood for fires, and of course, it's a ready source of food and drink. The secret is to find a coconut that's so full of liquid that when you shake it, you can't hear any sloshing around because that's the life-giving fluid in there, a safe drink. And this is how you open it. That first cut is to produce this, a little spoon with which I can scoop out the contents of the coconut later on. delicious. It's a warm drink, absolutely beautiful. Now you can drink about four of these a day. That's about four litres. If you drink more than that, it acts as a laxative with some pretty dire consequences. And of course, once the fluid's been drunk, we take our spoon and scoop out the flesh inside. So it's a drink and a meal all in one. And in 1943, the humble coconut saved the life of Bill Coffin, a US fighter pilot with an amazing story of survival. Bill was forced to ditch his plane and bail out 240 miles inside enemy territory. His life jacket was damaged, but he managed to struggle out of his parachute harness before it dragged him under. Suddenly, instead of returning to base, Bill was adrift and struggling to remember survival techniques he'd learned in the States and thought he'd never have to use. You know, an, an airman, doesn't figure he's ever going to get shot down, but the, the training uh, gave him enough information to have a reasonable chance of getting back. Bill spent two days adrift with no food or water before being washed ashore. He'd lost all his emergency rations and medical kit, but he had managed to salvage a knife, and with that, he could at least open coconuts to get at the food and liquid inside. But when search parties failed to find him after five days, he realized he'd die if he didn't find someone to help him. He was now facing a battle far tougher than anything he'd fought in the sky. Well, I think most airmen were terrified, even more so of, uh, of the terrain that they came down in than of the enemy up in the air. But he couldn't stay where he was, so for three weeks, he paddled from island to island. 
He was getting weaker all the time, and he constantly risked being spotted and taken prisoner by the Japanese. Luckily for Bill, he was able to avoid the enemy. But unluckily, he found himself in an area that was sparsely inhabited, so he had to keep island hopping in the hope of finding someone who could help him. Then, suffering from infected bites and malaria, as well as diarrhoea from his coconut diet, he staggered towards a building he'd seen from the raft. He was desperate to find help, even if it was an enemy camp. But all he found was a deserted plantation and some rotten eggs, which he forced himself to eat. Bill spent six days recuperating, rationing the eggs to two a day before moving on to the next island. But finding no one there, he returned to the plantation to gather his strength for one last attempt. By now, Bill knew the US military would have given him up for dead and abandoned their search. He put to sea and paddled for four days before passing out in a storm. Amazingly, he drifted into an inhabited island 32 days after ditching. He was so weak that he couldn't stand. His weight had dropped to seven stone, but he was still alive. By the time he was returned to his unit, he'd been missing for 72 days, and for half that time, he'd survived almost entirely on coconuts. They might not have kept him alive much longer, but knowing how to get into them for food and water had allowed him to live for just long enough. This is a mature coconut. When they're brown like this, that outer case becomes almost armor-plated, and they're very difficult to cut open. Consequently, we have to use a sharpened stick to lever the husk off. So, first thing to know is that a coconut has got three corners. One, two, three. And the stick has to go in on one of the corners to achieve leverage. That bear right down on it, a lot of weight. Hard work. Once you get in there, now we can lever. And we start to open up the husk. This may seem like hard work, but believe me, this is a lot easier than trying to open it with a knife. Beautiful. Right, so what I've got now is the coconut itself and all this fibre. And that's really good, it burns very well and I can use that with my fire to help me with fire lighting or just to cook on. You can think of the coconut like a face with the two eyes on the right hand side and the mouth on the left. That's where you get in for a drink. Ah, it's delicious. Now that's much stronger than in the immature coconut but a refreshing flavouring drink, not something you drink a lot of. Now, to open the coconut, we have to strike it smartly across the top of its skull there. One of the joys of being in remote places is mastering the skills that the local people use. In fact, it's the key to survival. I even swear that food tastes better here for the effort it takes to cook it. And of course, your life could depend on knowing how to light fires and find things to eat. I've talked about American servicemen and the problems they had surviving in this environment, but perhaps even more fascinating are the stories of Japanese soldiers who survived on some of these islands long after the war had ended. One of the most famous was Hiru Onoda. He was found in 1974, 29 years after going into hiding on the island of Lubang, about 200 kilometers from where I am. 
As part of his guerrilla warfare training, Anoda was taught to stay alive by any means necessary. When the Americans overran Lubang in 1945, most of the Japanese soldiers surrendered and two dozen died in suicide raids. But Onoda went into hiding, saying later that he wasn't prepared to give himself up until his commanding officer ordered him to do so. The Japanese sent several search parties to look for him, but Onoda even managed to persuade himself that his elderly father's voice was a cunning imitation by Americans out to trick him, and he avoided all attempts at contact. He lived a nomadic lifestyle, building makeshift huts wherever he felt safest. To keep track of time, he observed the phases of the moon, and amazingly, after 30 years, it was only six days out. For food, Anoda made the most of the fruit and vegetables that grew wild, but he also rigged up ingenious snares. This is a simple noose for catching birds, and it's based on traps that he'd seen the islanders make. And this is a rat trap. The bait inside is connected by woven fibers to a trigger. When the rat takes the bait, it releases the trigger and the door falls down, trapping it inside. Occasionally, a noda would also raid local farms to steal pigs or cows. For a taste of home, he would rig up a simple steamer using bamboo sticks. Any extra meat he had, he would smoke and preserve for later, working always by night to avoid detection. In the end, it was a lone Japanese adventurer who found him, but he wouldn't be persuaded the war was over until he was told so by his former commanding officer. So Major Yoshimi Tanaguchi was sent to tell him to come out of hiding. So Haru Onoda's private war ended after nearly 30 years, but he'd only managed to carry on that long because he knew Lubang better than the locals and could always stay one step ahead of them. On a confined area like a tropical island, you can explore every corner. That gives you a chance to find sources of food and drink and to find out what nasties might be lurking in the bush. These ants could give me a bit of a nip, but there are also cobras and scorpions to avoid. There are edible plants on the island. I've seen the flowers of wild passion fruit and mangoes, but there's only one fruit that's ready to eat at the moment. This here is the pandanus, and this fruit is just ripening now. The bit you eat is this orange tip here. Mm, it's delicious. What we've got is lots of fibers covered in a sweet, oily pulp, very palm-like, delicious. Mm. The other thing you can do is cut it open because in each of those segments, there's an edible seed. If you're on these islands for any length of time, meat is going to be important in your diet. One animal you might think about catching is the monitor lizard. This is a trap for just such an animal. What I've done basically is constructed a tunnel out of split bamboo. That's the real joy of the tropics. There's never a shortage of material to work with. Now, running vertically into that trap is this stick here, on the end of which is bait. And when the animal pulls on that, it dislodges these two loops here, which go in either direction, allowing the doors to shut. Now, when the doors shut, this bar here will drop down in front of it and lodge against these forward uprights so that it's effectively locked shut. Of course, if you catch a lizard, you've got enough food for a week. These may look like droppings, but they're actually tropical almonds, smaller and sweeter than the ones you get at home, and tricky to get into, even with a machete, but I found loads of them. Quite delicious. Another thing I came across while I was foraging on the coastline a few minutes ago was that, you might recognize it, cashew nut. You can't eat that as it is because it's in a husk which is poisonous. It needs roasting and then shelling before it can be made safe. And of course, where there's one, there are probably others. So I'm going to carry on having.
Other uses you can put various bits to. If you take the leaf and you pull out the midrib, you end up with a very flexible but strong wiry material, which has traditionally been used in these parts to make a snare for birds like this, just plaited with snares set in it. If you run out of shoes or your shoes fall apart, then you can take the husk of a coconut, cut a slit in it, and insert fibers or leaves here from the coconut itself and form an improvised sandal. And they're actually very comfortable and quite durable. And of course, the coconut shell itself is a natural eating bowl. And all you have to do to clean that out is to split one in half and leave it out for the ants. And they'll do that almost overnight. But the golden rule of survival on an island like this is to use the resources you find in moderation without destroying them. And here is a clear example of a food source that's almost been killed off by overuse. Seafood is an important part of the local diet, but commercial fishermen have come in from the outside using illegal and highly damaging methods like dynamite fishing. They've destroyed much of the coral here, as well as the marine life it supports. All this is in stark contrast to the days when local fishermen would take just what they needed, using simple spears and goggles made from turtle shell filed down till you could see through it. It's always exciting when you see a turtle in the wild. But this one looks like he's been through the wars. Probably at some time or other he's been caught in a fisherman's net. Turtles are protected by law, but people have survived on their meat. Here there are also clams to collect, as well as crabs and prawns to catch. But it's fun being a spectator as well. Cattlefish are just the most amazing creatures. Whenever I see them, I think of aliens. Mind you, I must look pretty strange to them too. Near here, conservationists are surveying the reefs to try and save creatures and habitats like this from the pressures of tourism and overfishing before it's too late. You can't underestimate the importance of fish to the people who live here. And there's a fantastic way to cook them to perfection using hot rocks in a sand oven. has burned right down to ashes now and the rocks are very hot. This is the time to put the fish in. A layer of leaves protects the fish from the hot rocks. A second layer protects them from the sand as I pile it on top to seal the oven. So the last job is to put water in to create steam heat. I could actually cook the fish just on the dry, hot rocks there, but that's not what I'm going to do today. So that's why I put this stick in. I pull him out, and into the hole that's left, I pour this water. Well, I reckon that fish should be about done now. The secret is to very carefully remove, oh yeah, that's good and hot. <laughs> very carefully remove the sand. Let's go and get that off there. The heat really coming through now. Wonderful. It's a great way to cook. Let's see how well that is done. And that is absolutely beautifully cooked. Oh, fantastic.
I love the tropics. Everywhere you look, you can see the force of nature at work around you. I can't think of anywhere else on the planet you feel more alive. Tomorrow I have to leave the island, so this is my last evening. And I can tell you, I'm not looking forward to having to get on a boat and sail away from here.